So thank you all very much uh, for being here. This is the very first uh, uh, public event organized by the Wheeler Institute for Business and Development, which has been recently established thanks to the very big generosity of Tony and Maureen Wheeler. And I want to all us thank uh, Tony for being here with us uh, today. He's one of our greatest alumni. Most of us have read the books uh, about all the places that you have visited and we have followed your leads and we're truly grateful uh, uh, as London Business School for your generosity and for your generous support. So this is the very first event of the Wheeler Institute for Business and Development and we are looking forward in the next years to promote research, uh, cutting edge research on the intersection of business and development, further expand our portfolio of experiential uh, learning that we do programs in Johannesburg, in Lima, in many parts of the world, and we plan to expand this, uh, uh, this process, and this is one of the visions of the Wheeler Institute. And at the same time, we want to bring engagement and bring awareness of some of the most cutting-edge problems that the world is being faced. And we couldn't come up with a better uh, presenter and speaker for the very first event uh, than Raj Chetty. Uh, Raj is a professor of economics uh, at Stanford. He is a household name. Uh, even in my country, Greece, he's one of the very few economists that people recognize. Raj has done path-breaking research on the equality of opportunity, and uh, I'll leave it to him to explain uh, how uh, uh, to explain the, this research agenda. Let me stress that uh, Raj uh, completed his PhD and got tenure at Harvard, uh, I guess at the age of 26, 27, when I was still a student. Uh, since then, he has been decorated with the MacArthur Genius Fellowship, and he has also been decorated by the John Clark Bates Award, which is awarded every two years, and now every one year, to the American economist that has had the most uh, significant impact in the profession by the age of 40. And I think Raj was perhaps the youngest uh, uh, laureate uh, of this award. Uh, but most importantly, it's not the awards uh, that make someone, but actually the super impactful work that Raj has, uh, has conducted. Some of this research has been covered in LBS courses, but we're really thankful, Raj, for taking the time and visiting us, and we look forward to your, to your remarks. Thank you very much. So thanks so much uh, for the warm introduction. Can you all hear me? Is the mic, is the mic fine? Uh, so it's a pleasure to be here, especially for this inaugural event. I appreciate you setting up this center, and I hope it'll uh, do great things going forward. So I'm gonna talk today about improving equality of opportunity, which is a big, uh, complicated topic, and I'm gonna talk about it from the perspective of how we can use big data or modern administrative data to really think about these issues at a very granular level. But I wanna start at a big picture level by talking about the idea of the American dream, which is a complicated concept that means different things to different people, but let's distill it for simplicity to a statistic that we can measure systematically in the data, which is the chance that a child born to parents in the bottom fifth of the income distribution makes the leap to the top fifth of the income distribution. So this is the classic rags to riches, Horatio Alger version of the American dream, what people think America is kind of known for as a land of opportunity. So how common is it that in fact a child can make this climb from the bottom to the top? So here are some statistics on that for the United States and other countries for which we have comparable data. So as you can see here, in the US, uh, kids born to parents in the bottom fifth of the income distribution have a 7.5% chance of reaching the top fifth of the income distribution. That compares with 9% here in the United Kingdom, 11.7% in Denmark, 13.5% in Canada. Now when people look at these statistics, sometimes they initially react by saying, oh, even in Canada, it looks like your odds of success aren't all that high, right? Only a 13.5% chance of making it in some sense. Now, you have to remember, of course, that no matter what you do, you can't have more than 20% of people in the top 20%, right? <laughs> and so to make that a little bit more precise, this is, these are conditional probabilities. So theoretically, it's possible that 100% of people who start out in the bottom 20% could end up in the top 20%. But in order for that to be the case, it would actually have to be true that for people born to higher income families, they're less likely 
to make it to the top. So if you make the reasonable assumption that we're never going to live in a society where your odds of succeeding are negatively related to your parent income, which I think is a reasonable premise, then the upper bound that the statistic could plausibly be is 20%. And so relative to that maximum of 20%, these are actually quite large differences in rates of upward mobility, rates of social mobility. The way I think about it is that in some sense, your chances of achieving the American dream of moving up are twice as high if you're growing up in Canada rather than the United States. Now, uh, motivated by these kinds of issues, there's growing concern in the US and I, I think equally well in the UK. There's less data in the UK at the moment, which is something that I think could be fixed and should be fixed. But as best we can tell, the UK and US look somewhat similar on this dimension. There, there's a concern that these countries are no longer really a land of opportunity for people growing up in, in low-income families. And so motivated by that, my uh, colleagues and I uh, are in what we're calling the Equality of Opportunity Project are just studying this very big picture question of how can we increase social mobility. And so our approach has uh, some broad themes, which I'll bring out through a series of specific studies in this talk. The first is to draw upon um, big data, to use the Silicon Valley uh, buzzword, to study how to increase upward mobility. So much as you hear about large data sets uh, in the private sector being used to improve products offered by companies like Amazon or Google. Analogously, I think a very important trend in economics is the use of such data, typically from government sources, but increasingly from places like Facebook or Twitter and so on, to tackle social and economic policy questions. And so I'll illustrate how we do that in various ways uh, in this talk. Second, the approach we take is very broad in terms of the set of uh, mechanisms and interventions we consider. So rather than coming at this from a particular methodological perspective, like we're only going to think about education, we actually think about a range of issues from housing policy to education to other things, uh, from childhood to adulthood. And so you'll see a span of different possibilities that you might want to think about, because I really think this is a multifaceted problem that doesn't just boil down to one class of interventions. And third, much of what we do starts from uh, a focus on geographic variation. The fact that there are very sharp differences in kids' chances of climbing the income ladder across areas, even within countries. And so the data that I'm going to show you today is primarily from the United States. But I'll talk about in the end how I think we can do analogous work in other countries. And Elias was is, is doing analogous work, in fact, in Africa. And there are other people doing similar work in Canada and so forth. So I think a lot of the results that I'm going to talk about here, while they're from American data, can be potentially transported to the UK, or at least similar analysis can be done here. So let's start by looking at the data within America, where we use information from tax returns covering about 10 million kids. So basically, all the kids born in America in the early 1980s, we're able to link them to their parents using data from tax returns and look at the geography of upward mobility within the United States. So similar measures of upward mobility that I was thinking about across countries before, let's now look at that within America. So what we're doing here is assigning kids to locations within the United States um, metro areas uh, based on where they grew up. And then we're looking here at a very simple statistic, which is if you grow up in a relatively low-income family, a family at the 25th percentile of the parental income distribution, that's a family making about $25,000 a year, what is your own income when you're around 30 years old on average? What's your own household income? And the map is colored so that green colors represent areas with higher levels of upward mobility, where you see low-income kids doing well in absolute terms and red represent areas with lower levels of upward mobility. So let me first draw your eye just to the scale on the right-hand side of the figure. So you can see it in the darkest green colors, you have mean incomes of $43,000 a year. In the darkest red colors, mean incomes of $26,000 a year. This is conditional on starting at the same place, importantly, right? So this difference of nearly a factor of two in your mean income is an enormous difference in children's prospects and life outcomes in general. And so you, know, you can see the broad geographic patterns for yourself. The center of the country, for example, has very high rates of upward mobility. Much of the southeast, places like Atlanta, Georgia, Charlotte, North Carolina, have very low levels of upward mobility. Those patterns, you know, at some level, they might seem intuitive that the southeast has lower levels of upward mobility. But then you think about it a little bit more carefully. You might know 
Atlanta is one of the cities with the highest rates of job growth in the United States. It's the engine of jobs in America. Yet it's surprising if you're a poor kid growing up in Atlanta, you don't have very good prospects in terms of climbing the income ladder. And in fact, when you look at the data in a more detailed way, you see that Atlanta is essentially outsourcing its talent production. Lots of people move to Atlanta to get good jobs. But the low-income kids who are growing up in Atlanta itself don't end up doing particularly well. And so you know, the, the, the patterns here, I think, are, are important in, <clears throat> in trying to understand you know, why there's such sharp differences in rates of upward mobility across places. So in this big map, uh, your eye naturally gravitates to this very broad regional variation between the middle of the country, the coasts, and so forth, which look better. Turns out, though, that if you zoom in, so let's take one example. Let's zoom into the New York City uh, metro area and look at the data now by county in New York, which corresponds to the different boroughs in New York City, so like Manhattan, Queens, and so forth. What you see is that there continues to be significant variation even at a much more local level. And so we continue to see this in our ongoing research. I don't have this data publicly available yet, but we're going down to the census tract level, which are units of 4,000 people each. So think about almost the block level. And you continue to see you know, substantial variation even within a given town across different neighborhoods. And so you can see here, take the New York example, a low-income kid growing up in Manhattan so that would typically be a place like Harlem if you're a low-income family in, in Manhattan. Um, you're earning $32,000 a year. But then if you go over to Queens just nearby, it's a mean income of $40,000 a year. Again, conditional on growing up in family with the same level of income. <coughs> and so naturally, the question in light of the sort of sharp variation in rates of upward mobility at fine geographies is why does upward mobility vary so much across areas? That's of interest to us as academics in understanding uh, what the mechanisms are driving these differences. And it's of interest to policymakers who want to figure out how you might replicate the successes of some of the green colored areas on the map elsewhere in the country. So I'm going to show you uh, a set of results uh, trying to answer this question. And there's much that remains to be learned about why upward mobility varies, varies across areas and what we can ultimately do to change upward mobility. Let me start by establishing a first set of results showing that most of the variation in upward mobility is caused by differences in childhood environments. So there are two key words in that first bullet. The first is the word caused. That is, it's actually about the causal effect of growing up in different places. It's not just that the type of people who grow up in Queens are different from the type of people who grow up in Manhattan. If you take a given child and put that child in Queens instead of Manhattan, you see different outcomes for that given child. And the second is that this is about childhood environment. So you might have had, you know, one of the first hypotheses we had is maybe this is about differences in the types of jobs that are available in different areas or differences in labor market conditions. But in fact, what you see is that it really seems to be about differences in what's going on while you're growing up. Okay, and so the way I'm gonna demonstrate that is from a study we've done of seven million families that move across areas within the United States. Again, exploiting the power of having these data sets that cover essentially the entire uh, US population. And so rather than getting into the econometric and statistical details of that study, I'm gonna summarize what we find with a simple example. So let's say we take a set of kids who start out in Manhattan, uh, which we saw in the previous figure has relatively low rates of upward mobility, low uh, outcomes for kids growing up in low-income families compared to surrounding areas in New York, okay? and so. We saw in particular that kids who grow up in Manhattan from birth earn about $32,000 on average when we measure their incomes at age 30. So now what I want to do is think about a set of kids who move from Manhattan to Queens, whereas we saw kids who grow up there from birth tend to have better outcomes. And what I want to do is think about kids whose parents moved uh, when they were at different ages. So let's start by thinking about children who move when they were exactly two years old from Manhattan to Queens. And so what we do in this analysis is track those kids forward 28 years and measure their own earnings when they are age 30. And what you can see here is that these children are earning on average about $37,000 when they are 30 years old. Okay, so that's for the kids who move when they're exactly two. Now let's repeat that analysis for kids who move when they're three, four, five, and so on. And what you see is a very clear declining pattern 
the later you make that move from Manhattan to Queens, the less of a gain you get. If you move by the time you're in your early 20s, you get essentially no gain at all. And if you move after that point, the relationship is completely flat. So what do you see from this analysis? I think there are three key takeaways. The first is that where you grow up really matters. It's not just that the kids who live in Manhattan are different from the kids who live in Queens. You take a given child and move that child from Manhattan to Queens, you see very different outcomes. I see that as a very encouraging result because it shows that this problem is actually changeable. You can actually meaningfully change people's outcomes through a simple move a few miles away. Not to say that that's the right policy solution to be helping people, to be moving people to different areas necessarily, but it just shows you that this is a malleable thing, which I think is a, at least a good place to start. Second, what you can see here is that what really seems to matter is childhood environment rather than conditions in adulthood. You see in these data and other experimental data that we've looked at that if you have people move to different areas as adults, it doesn't really have much of an impact on their outcomes. It's really about what's going on in your childhood. And the third thing that you see is that every extra year of exposure to a better environment adds up to better outcomes in the long run. So you can see that if you get to a, be a better environment, in this case, Queens instead of Manhattan, at age eight instead of nine, or 15 instead of 16, there's an incremental impact for every extra year of exposure. The relationship looks somewhat concave, meaning that the slope is steeper in the teenage years rather than in the early years. And so what that, I think, is telling us is that the neighborhood environment actually seems to matter more around your teenage years than it does at the very earliest years, which I think is an interesting result from a policy perspective because, as you, many of you will know, there's a lot of discussion about the importance of early childhood intervention at the moment. And while we think early childhood intervention can be extremely valuable, what these data show you is that being in a better environment while you're a teenager or an adolescent is equally, if not more important, in terms of uh, neighborhood conditions. Now, one just quick note for the economists in the audience, those who are interested in you know, how do we make a causal claim here, the key assumption we're making is that the types of families who move when kids are young versus when kids are older are similar to each other. So the experiment here, the identification assumption, is that there's a similarity in the potential outcomes of children who move when they're young and when they're old. So you might worry, maybe the people who move when they're relatively young are from more affluent families, more educated families. Maybe it's not an apples to apples comparison when you look at kids who move when they're young and old. So we do a number of tests to try to address that sort of concern. Let me give you one example. So you can look at siblings within a family and compare their outcomes. Let's say you take a family that moves with a seven-year-old and a 13-year-old. And remarkably, if you do exactly the same analysis looking at siblings, you get exactly the same picture. The seven-year-old kid does better than the 13-year-old kid, exactly in proportion to that six-year age gap, very similar to the pattern that I'm showing you here. So that you know, takes out the possibility that it's different types of families moving when it's young versus old. So you can do many things along those lines that have led us and many others to be convinced that neighborhoods really have a causal effect on rates of upward mobility. Okay, great. So naturally, your next question might be, okay, so now we've established that your chances of climbing the income ladder seem to depend greatly on where you grow up. So what is the recipe for success uh, in places that have high rates of upward mobility that were in the green colors on the map relative to, to the places in the red colors. If we could figure out what that recipe is, we could presumably replicate that elsewhere in the US, perhaps in other countries, and so forth. Now, figuring out what that recipe for success is is incredibly challenging. It's something that we are continuing to work on, many people are, are uh, working on. What I'm gonna do here is something simpler. I'm gonna correlate these differences in upward mobility across areas with various characteristics that economists and sociologists have thought about over the years. Starting with, and, and so for simplicity, we've looked at a variety of different factors in these correlations. I'm going to summarize what we find by focusing on the five strongest correlates uh, that we've identified, okay? And so the first one is residential segregation. We find that places that are less residentially segregated by race or by income tend to have higher rates of, of upward mobility. Now, there are many different ways in which you can measure residential segregation from a statistical point of view. It turns out the patterns here are so stark that you can just see them visually and it doesn't really matter 
what statistic you use. So let me give you a couple examples. So let's go back to Atlanta, Georgia, which as I pointed out was one of the places with the lowest levels of upward mobility in the US. So this map here depicts racial segregation in the Atlanta metro area. The way it's constructed is every person in Atlanta uh, using census data is represented by a dot. And the dots are colored so that whites are blue, blacks are green, Asians are red, and Hispanics are orange. So you can see immediately, it doesn't matter how you measure it, it's obvious Atlanta is an incredibly segregated city. The blacks live in a completely different part of the city relative to white uh, Americans in, in, in Atlanta. And so cities that look like this in terms of residential structure where they're completely, people are completely separated from each other tend to have the lowest levels of upward mobility in the United States. Now, why exactly is that? It could be about social interaction that matters that's not happening when you have this kind of rigid structure. It could also be about other mechanisms. So if you think about funding for public schools, for example, if you live in a very segregated area, minorities and lower income people, because schools are financed using a local tax base in the US, using local property taxes, you are gonna have a more poorly funded school if you live in a very segregated city as a low income kid relative to if you live in a more integrated city. So we don't know exactly what the mechanism is yet that drives this correlation, but that's one very strong pattern in the data that more segregated cities have low levels of upward mobility. Now interestingly, if you look as a contrast at Sacramento, California, which is a city with relatively high levels of upward mobility, you can see Sacramento, it has the same minority share as Atlanta, the same fraction of blacks and Hispanics as Atlanta, but you can see the colors are much more interspersed here than what you saw in Atlanta. They're not perfectly integrated by any means, but it's much more integrated, and corresponding to that, cities that look like this in terms of residential structure tend to have high levels of upward mobility. So that's one strong pattern in the data uh, that places with low, uh, that segregation is strongly associated with these differences in, in mobility. Now going a little bit more quickly through um, the, uh, the other factors, we find that places with a larger middle class, so more people between the 25th and 75th percentile of the national income distribution, tend to have higher levels of mobility across generations. So why is this important? It suggests that there could be a link between inequality within a generation and your ability to climb the income ladder across generations. And as we live in an era of growing income inequality, insofar as there's a causal relationship between those two things, we might be concerned that as we have growing inequality, we might have uh, lower chances for kids to climb the income ladder as well, which would potentially be quite concerning. The third and fourth factors I'm gonna talk about come more from the sociology literature. We find that places with more stable family structures, so more two-parent families, for instance, tend to have higher levels of upward mobility. Interestingly, this actually turns out to be the single strongest correlation in the data. The fraction of two-parent families in an, area, in an area is incredibly strongly predictive of differences in mobility. Now, in thinking about that correlation, the first explanation that might come to your mind is that growing up in a two-parent household is, you know, might be beneficial for children relative to growing up in a single-parent household. And while that is a little bit of what's going on, that's actually not the key driver of the correlation. And the way that you can see that is if you look at a set of kids whose own parents are married, so only look at kids who are growing up in two-parent families, and compare kids who grow up in an area with a lot of single parents versus kids who grow up in an area with a lot of two-parent families, you continue to find the same uh, correlation. So in other words, even if my own parents are married, but I grow up in an area with a lot of single parents, I'm less likely to climb the income ladder which shows you that it's not literally about whether my own parents are married or not. It's again picking up some community level factor, we don't know exactly what, that's associated with uh, kids' long-term outcomes. The fourth factor is a little bit related to that. It's the idea of social capital popularized uh, in a well-known book by Bob Putnam at Harvard called Bowling Alone, which some of you might know. Um, and so the, I, the way I think about social capital is the old adage that it takes a village to raise a child. Will someone else help you out even if you're not doing well? In the US, a city thought to have a lot of social capital, the canonical example is Salt Lake City with the Mormon church. It's thought to be a place with a lot of social capital, correspondingly has very high levels of social mobility. Now, the reason, uh, you know, measuring some of these things is quite challenging. The reason I actually mentioned Bob Putnam's book, Bowling Alone, is that 
the, the reason he used that title is he used uh, bowling alleys, the presence of bowling alleys, and in particular whether people were bowling alone as a proxy for social capital in an area. Now, to my amazement, the number of bowling alleys is actually very highly correlated with these differences in mobility that I've been showing you here. <laughs> the reason I, I mention that, though, is an important caveat to everything that I'm showing you on this slide is that these are correlations rather than causal effects. So where you can see that is, you know, I'd be quite surprised if the policy solution here is that we need to build more bowling alleys to increase social mobility, right? So you should look at these more as clues about what might matter rather than the mechanisms in terms of what we need to manipulate through policy in order to get better outcomes. Now the fifth case, uh, which is quite intuitive, places with higher quality primary and secondary education tend to have higher levels of mobility. There, there's a large body of evidence suggesting that's not just true correlationally. Um, there are strong causal effects of the quality of education on kids' long-term outcomes. And so I wanna show you a little bit of uh, that type of work, which has been done in our research team, but many others as well. And I'm gonna give you one quick example of that that illustrates how you can use these types of data to get more precisely at mechanisms and what types of policy changes might actually have an impact. So let's talk a little bit about education policy in more detail. Not because I think that's the most important thing on that list of five factors, it's the one that we happen to have been able to study in some more detail. So how can we use big data to study teachers' impact? So in, in the next uh, study that I'm gonna talk about, we go back to, um, we get data from New York City, uh, the New York City School District, where we get information on two and a half million kids who attended New York City public schools between 1989 and 2009. Over that period, they wrote 18 million tests. Uh, we link that data to the tax records that I was working with for the first part of the analysis that I've been showing you. So that we can uh, look at, you can ask a question like, how does your third grade teacher affect how much you're earning when you're 30 years old? Because you've linked the New York City School District data to the tax data, right? And so you can look at things like earnings, college attendance, teenage birth, because lots of things get measured in, in US tax records. Okay, so in order to show you that teacher quality has some impact on children's later life outcomes, I first need to have a measure of teacher quality that I'm gonna work with. And so the measure I'm gonna focus on here is one that is of great policy relevance in the US, um, which are uh, test score based metrics. And my understanding is there's discussion of these kinds of measures here in the UK as well. And so you know, one very prominent measure of teacher quality are what are called teacher value added measures. So the idea of these measures is how much, you're basically trying to measure how much a teacher raises his or her students' test scores on average. So let me give you a simple example of how you compute a value added measure. Let's say I'm a fourth grade teacher. We take my students' test scores on average at the end of fourth grade, minus their test scores on average at the beginning of fourth grade. And if that number is very positive, we'd say I'm a high value added teacher. And if it's very negative, we'd say I'm a low value added teacher. Okay, so that's, a, a rough description, there are more complicated statistical details in the background in terms of what people actually do, but roughly that's the concept that people are trying to capture. How much test score growth is there uh, for a given teacher? So there's a really controversial debate in the US about whether these measures actually provide good measures of teacher quality, should we be using these for teacher evaluation, and so forth. It's been the subject of a lot of litigation and uh, other policy debate. Now, in order to answer whether these measures are, are uh, good measures of teacher quality, it's useful to step back and ask, as a scientist, what's the ideal experiment that you would run in order to determine whether this is a good proxy for teacher quality? So what, what I would wanna do is, let's say you construct a bunch of measures of these value-added uh, scores for teachers based on historical data. Then you'd wanna run an experiment where you tell parents, look, we wanna answer this really important question of whether uh, teacher value added matters. So we're gonna randomly assign your children, some of them to low, teachers we've identified as being low value added, some as high value added, and let's see how they do in 25 years. That's the kind of experiment you'd wanna run. Now you can imagine most parents don't wanna participate in that sort of experiment, <laughs> which is the challenge in, in empirical social science. So the, the power of large data sets in my view is that you can essentially find those types of experiments in the observational data that we already have. 
And so let me illustrate how we do that uh, in this paper. We exploit the fact that there's a lot of turnover in school districts where, you know, in a given year, there might be a teacher who happens to be teaching a given grade, but then they go on maternity leave or they end up switching to a different grade or to a different school. And so there's a lot of variation in the set of teachers in a given grade across cohorts. And that variation is essentially random from the perspective of a student. It's hard to imagine that you select a given school because you know there's gonna be a seventh grade teacher, you know, in, in when you get there as opposed to in the next year and so on. And so to show you how we exploit that variation, again, I'm just gonna describe this in the context of a simple example. Let's imagine that we track a given school in New York City over time, uh, and we look at kids who get to uh, fourth grade in different school years. So these are kids born in different years, right? They're in different birth cohorts. And so we're gonna look at kids' average test scores in fourth grade, um, at, uh, in, in each of these school years, all right? So what you can see here uh, is if you just look at test scores, you know, um, going across these school years, they're bouncing around around the median on average, all right? So now what happens in this school is that at the end of the 1995 school year, there's a new teacher who comes in who's in the top 5% of the value-added distribution. So based on these prior data, we expect this teacher to be uh, really high quality. So let's look at what happens to test scores when that new teacher uh, comes in. You can see that test scores immediately jump up and they continue to remain high for subsequent cohorts of children. So now I'm describing this in the context of a single example. What we're actually doing here is looking at thousands of such events that occur in the data. That's the power of having the 20 years of data with two and a half million kids, okay? So you can see test scores immediately jump up when the high value added teacher comes in consistent with the idea that that teacher is actually improving students' outcomes. Now, as you all know, in any experiment, you wanna have a treatment group where you change something, in this case, the better teacher coming in, but you also wanna have a control group to make sure that nothing else changed at the same time that might be confounding your analysis. So in this case, you know, what's a natural control group? Since the better teacher came in in fourth grade, you would expect that teacher should have no impact on test scores in third grade, right? Because they haven't taught the, the students yet. And so in fact, when you plot test scores in third grade, you can see that they're perfectly flat. Um, uh, this is showing you the same, the dashed lines, the same analysis for third grade test scores. There's no change in third grade test scores when the better teacher comes in in fourth grade, which is as you'd expect, very consistent with the idea that the teacher seems to have a positive causal effect. So I've emphasized in this particular example a very high quality teacher coming in and the positive impacts they have on student learning. This works perfectly symmetrically in the opposite direction. If you have this teacher here who doesn't wanna be there, who's in the bottom 5% of the value added distribution, they immediately pull down test scores as soon as they arrive relative to the prior grade. So it's perfectly symmetric across the distribution. Okay, so what we can then do now, tying this back to social mobility, right? So here I've just been showing you the impacts of teachers on test scores, which I think of as an intermediate proxy. We don't care about test scores in and of themselves. We care about kids doing well in the long run. So what we then do is repeat the analysis that I'm showing you here using the information from the tax returns on earnings, college attendance rates, things like that. And we document similar patterns. So rather than going through the details of that, I'm gonna summarize what we find uh, with a simple example with a hypothetical policy exercise, okay? So let's say we take the uh, set of teachers we have, we estimate their value added, and we have the bell curve of teacher quality, okay? And suppose we identify the teachers who are estimated to be in the bottom 5% of that distribution highlighted here in the yellow, okay? Now, a feasible policy that we could implement if we wanted to, in fact, some school districts in the US have started to do this, is uh, take those teachers who are in the bottom 5% and either hire new teachers who would be of average quality, presumably, or give them training that brings them, let's say, up to the average quality level if you're able to figure out how to do that. So what impact, uh, what impact would that have? So think about a policy exercise where we take out that lower tail and have teachers of average quality. Our estimates based on the analysis that I just showed you imply that if you replace a single teacher uh, in a single grade of 
in the bottom 5% with a teacher of average quality, you would raise the lifetime earnings of a given child by $50,000. If you aggregate that over a classroom of average size in the US, which is 28 students, that's a $1.4 million return over the lifetime of kids taught by that teacher for a single year. You discount that back at a very generous 5% interest rate um, to, to present value to the point of the intervention. Uh, and that's worth about $250,000 in money today. Okay, And so the point here is that it's just a simple exercise to show you that teachers have quite substantial impacts on kids' long-term outcomes. A major issue in the US at the moment is that public schools really have no capacity to retain the best teachers or recruit the best teachers because salaries are set in a way that they're entirely a function of experience. So if you've got a really good teacher to whom you'd like to pay a bonus, they might have some other attractive career option, uh, or they go teach at a private school or something, you basically have no way of uh, giving them an incentive to stay. And so I think creating flexibility in these kinds of systems and trying to recruit and retain the best teachers can really have an important effect on social mobility, tying back to what we were talking about earlier. Okay, so um, I want to next turn to a slightly different set of issues. It's okay if I take another yeah. five, ten minutes. Uh, okay, so I, I've been emphasizing the role of neighborhoods, socioeconomic class, uh, and schools. But I want, want to now show you a very different set of data that I think paints a more nuanced picture. So uh, I, in, in particular, I want to emphasize that the factors that I've been talking about, neighborhood, environment, schools, and so on, are not the sole determinants of economic opportunity. There are substantial differences on other dimensions as well. And so I'm going to illustrate that by focusing on some recent work we've done looking at racial disparities in income mobility. So to start out, uh, this chart here shows you how rates of income mobility vary by race in the United States. So what we're doing here is each dot represents 1% of the parent income distribution. So there are 100 dots here, lowest income. Kids growing up in the lowest income families on the left, highest income families so like the top 1% is the far right dot. Average incomes of $1.1 million per year for people in that, uh, in that top dot, okay? And we're showing on the vertical axis the average uh, income percentile that where kids end up separately for white kids in the blue dots and black kids in the red dots. And you can see throughout the income distribution, black kids end up faring more poorly than white kids. Um, and you know, much to my surprise, you know, what I was most struck by when we did this plot is I had expected going into this project that you would see some convergence at the top of the distribution, that at some point race would become less important. If you're from a very high income family, perhaps uh, you know, the black-white gap would be smaller. That turns out to be completely wrong. You can see that the gap at the top is almost exactly the same as the gap at the bottom. It's about uh, 10 percentiles. And so what that means intuitively is that there are very high rates of downward mobility among black kids growing up in high income families. So now, you know, 10 percentiles, is that a big difference? Is that a small difference? It's a little bit hard to get a feel for that. So I think a more intuitive uh, and salient way to look at it is this chart here, which the New York Times put together uh, using our data, which is a nice vis visualization of rates of downward mobility for black versus white kids. So what we do here is take a set of kids who grew up in families in the top 20% of the income distribution. They grew up in relatively rich families. And we look at where they ended up in the income distribution, with black dots representing black men, uh, green dots representing white men. Sorry, purple dots represent black men, green dots represent white men. And you can see. The green dots tend to coast along at the top. If you're born to a rich white family, you tend to stay rich yourself. You'd stay in the top quintile or the second to top quintile. Whereas if you look at the purple dots, they come falling down at a very high rate. You know, a really uh, troubling statistic is that black men born to high income families have very high odds, almost as high odds of ending up at the bottom of the income distribution as they do of remaining near the top of the income distribution, right? So there's really an incredibly high rate of downward mobility among black men relative to white men, which I think is uh, you know, very disheartening. One way to think about it visually is if you think about the process of social mobility as climbing an income ladder for whites, uh, 
it's more like being on a treadmill for blacks because generation after generation, even after you climb up, you tend to fall back down uh, in the next generation. So it's strikingly, so the data I was just showing you, the previous chart and this chart are for black versus white men. If you now repeat this analysis for women, you see the pattern is very different. In fact, conditional on parental income, black women have higher levels of earnings than white women. And so this phenomenon of differences in mobility and racial disparities in the US is entirely driven by men rather than women. Uh, something you learn from these data that I think is at least useful for thinking about how you might try to target these problems going forward. Now, you see equally sharp gaps in other outcomes. So if you look at incarceration rates, uh, if you look at black men growing up in the lowest income families, on a given day, the date of the 2010 census, 21% of black men born to parents in the bottom 1% of the income distribution are incarcerated. That's on a single day, right? So it's an astonishingly high rate uh, for black men growing up in low income families. If you look at women, that's shown in the orange and green series down here, that's essentially not an issue. So these kinds of factors, I think, lead to very sharp uh, gender by race disparities that, that lead to sharp uh, inequalities in the US. So how does this relate to what I was talking about earlier on neighborhoods? Um, so let me go back now to the maps that I started out with, where I was showing you the geography of upward mobility in the US. But I'm now gonna repeat that analysis separately by race for black men on the left and white men on the right. Now what's remarkable about these maps is they look like they're on two different scales, two different color scales, but they're actually on the same color scale. It's just that the very best places for black men are worse than the very worst places for white men. So it's on a single scale, but the distributions are basically non-overlapping in terms of outcomes. So you take a place like Boston, which has the best outcome for low-income black men, of, uh, one of the best outcomes of $24,000 a year, that is worse than the average earnings of white men who grew up in Atlanta, where they have some of the worst outcomes among white men of $26,000 a year, right? So there's an astonishing uh, disparity um, across essentially all geographic regions in the United States in rates of upward mobility by race. And so that's the sense in which uh, I wanted to say that what I was showing you on neighborhoods earlier is by no means the only thing that we should be thinking about as we think about social, uh, social mobility. Racial disparities in outcomes persist even within neighborhoods. That is, black boys have lower chances of climbing the income ladder than white boys, even if they grow up on literally the same city block, go to the same school, are raised in two-parent families with comparable income, education, and wealth. These are sharp disparities that persist uh, within the type of areas that we, that we typically think about. And so, you know, you might wonder, okay, so what can you do about this? So you can still look at these data and ask, are there certain types of places that, uh, uh, that tend to have um, better outcomes for black men, right? There's some variation in the data. And so what you tend to see, I'm summarizing briefly here in, in, in the interest of time, uh, you find that places that have relatively low poverty rates, so what you might think of as good neighborhoods, um, good resources, good schools, and so forth, but also have two other critical factors. They have low levels of racial bias among whites. You can try to measure racial bias among whites. You see intuitively places that have lower levels of implicit or explicit racial bias tend to have better outcomes for black men. And then third, an intriguing pattern, places that have higher rates of father presence among blacks tend to have better outcomes for black men in particular. So if you're growing up in an area where a lot of kids are being raised, a lot of black kids are being raised in two-parent families, black men tend to do better. Black women, there's no association between father presence and their outcomes. So that's consistent with the growing literature that the presence of male role models might be very important for men's long-term outcomes. So this gives you some sense of the types of things that might matter. Again, correlational, but motivates a set of interventions one might try to do in the context of providing mentoring or role models or resources to try to help black kids thrive within a given area. The, the key message here is just putting black and white kids in the same school, in the same place, you're not gonna solve the problem just by that. You need to do, you need to do more than that to, to address racial disparities.
Okay, so if I can take five five more minutes to wrap up, or should we? I'm happy to, to wrap it up in three minutes because I have many questions. Many questions. Okay, so let me let me quickly summarize uh, one final piece of data that I think might be uh, relevant for uh, for this audience in particular here at, at a business school. So uh, I will uh, go through this briefly. So everything I've been showing you so far. Uh, on equality of opportunity, you know, the traditional argument for being interested in these things like racial differences and so forth is based on principles of justice. Uh, but I want to quickly show that you can take a very different perspective on this that shows us, I think, that all of us have a stake in these issues, which is that improving opportunities for upward mobility can also increase the size of the economic pie. And so to illustrate that, I'm going to focus on one particular pathway to upward mobility, which is innovation. So the way we do that is by linking the universe of patent records in the US to the tax data to study the lives of inventors in America, who ends up becoming an inventor in the United States. And so uh, I'll show you a, a quick chart that, uh, a couple quick charts that summarize the key point here. So the, the first thing you can see is that your probability of becoming an inventor is measured by having a patent is very strongly related to your uh, socioeconomic background. So kids who grew up in high income families are much more likely to become inventors than kids who grew up in low income families. Your odds of becoming an inventor are about 10 times higher if you happen to be born to parents in the top 1% of the income distribution relative to parents at the median. So the, I'll end with this. The, the last point I wanna make here on, on this is, you know, so you might, um, so one explanation for this sharp disparity is related to the things that I've been emphasizing in this talk, differences in environment, teachers, schools, resources, things like that. A different explanation, which you'd at least want to consider as a possibility from a scientific point of view, is that this is about intergenerational genetic transmission of ability. Presumably, the people who reach the top 1% had to be talented to get there, and maybe that's why their own kids are more likely to be uh, successful, more likely to become inventors, and so forth. So just to show you how you can start to get a sense of that, um, you can go back to the New York City school district data that I was talking about earlier and use test scores early on as a rough proxy for ability. So this is one example of the way that you can look at this. And so this chart here uh, plots patent rates again on the vertical axis. This time, instead of versus parent income, uh, it's against test scores, okay? and each dot here represents 5% of the test score distribution. And so you can see that these test scores have some predictive power. If you're below something like the 90th percentile of your third grade math class, your odds of going on to become an, an inventor are much, much lower than if you're at the top of your third grade math class. Okay, so that is an interesting pattern. How does it relate to what I was showing you earlier? I think the, the striking result is this. If you then split this data up, looking at kids who grew up in high-income families, families in the top quintile of the income distribution, versus kids who grew up in low- and middle-income families, you see that that kick up at the top in terms of rates of innovation is only there for the kids who grew up in high-income families, right? So in the orange, rather than the kids who grew up in the lower-income families. So to put it differently, high-scoring children are much more likely to become inventors if they are from high income families. Or a different way to think about it is, this suggests that in the US, in order to become an inventor, you really need two things. You need to be smart in some sense as measured by your test scores, math test scores early in childhood, and you need to be from a rich family. And so you can see why, you know, from the perspective of equality of opportunity, you, you, you might be concerned about this. The, the idea here is, it's not just that you will give um, kids from lower income backgrounds, better chances of succeeding themselves, but you got, might get more innovation and more growth if you bring those low income talented kids through the innovation pipeline and end up having them do uh, something great. Okay, so let's skip some of this uh, and end with this chart here. So I've shown you a series of results on uh, differences in opportunity in the US and how potentially we can make some progress in trying to tackle these problems. I want to. Uh, end by showing you from a historical perspective why I think thinking about these issues now is extremely important in the US, and I think this applies very likely in the UK as well. We don't have these data yet in the UK, but I suspect you have a similar pattern here. So what this chart is showing you is a different related way to think about economic mobility, 
which is what are your odds as a child of earning more than your parents did? If we measure both your earnings and your parents' earnings, let's say in your mid-30s and adjust for inflation, what fraction of kids do better than their parents did? And we're plotting that versus the year in which the child is born. And you can see that for kids born in the 1940s, in the middle of the last century, it was a virtual guarantee that you were going to achieve the American dream of moving up relative to your parents. Now, you can see what's happened. The American dream has basically faded over the past uh, 50 years or so, where for kids born in the 1980s who are about age 30 today, it's essentially a coin flip as to whether you're going to do better than your parents. And so I think this trend, my sense is, really captures the frustration that many people in the US are expressing, reflected in the election outcome, and so forth. And I think figuring out how to combat this trend, while it might seem like a you know, large national phenomenon, how could any one person, one business, one area do something about it? The key message that I hope you take from the set of results I've shown you is that I think the origins of this broad national trend are at very local levels. They start from our schools, our neighborhoods, what's going on in terms of exposure to innovation, uh, things like that. And those are things we can change in our own communities that then add up, I think, to a very different national picture. And my hope is with the type of data that we now have uh, and these types of methods, we'll be able to, in a precise way, tackle these problems going forward. Thanks very much. for this very insightful and fantastic presentation. So what we have done uh, at the Wheeler Institute, we have asked the Business and Government Club uh, to come up with some questions. They have been running some questions uh, uh, with their members. So they will jump start the discussion, and then we will open the floor uh, for, for, for discussions uh, for the audience. And just uh, make uh, one uh, quick point that at the Wheeler Institute, we really hope to bring together the various segments, if you like, of the London Business School community, alums, students, even staff, and we are very pleased to see many staff members uh, being here, and we want in the future events to engage as many as possible uh, from the broad LDSA community. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Professor Chetty, for this uh, truly fascinating uh, lecture. And I think uh, some of the data that you presented is, is just uh, staggering. Um, in the interest of time, the way that we want to structure the Q&A session is that we want to kick off um, the conversation with one or two questions, and we will then open it up um, to the floor. So um, you ended your lecture on, on the note saying that, um, uh, you know, with the recent rise of political populism, a lot of commentators believe that um, there, there's a direct correlation between lack of social uh, mobility, lack of economic opportunities, and political outcomes. Um, so I would be interested, um, have you seen in, in the data, have you seen some correlation between certain political outcomes uh, and, and social mobility? So for instance, is there lower voter turnout uh, in, in um, areas of uh, low social mobility, or is there a higher partisanship in, in those areas? Yeah, so that's a great question. So one pattern you see in the data, if you just take this chart, for example, this trend is the steepest. You see the steepest decline in the industrial Midwest, so places like Ohio, Detroit, and in particular among men in that area. So men in those types of areas are, I think their odds of earning more than their fathers did are something like 30% now. And if you think about the elect in the last election, the places that voted for Trump, the places that, you know, where you saw this kind of sentiment expressed the most are exactly those areas, exactly among men. So I think it does line up at some broad level with, um, you know, what people are expressing in the political debate. Voter turnout per se, I don't know uh, off the top of my head, um, but, but I certainly think that there's a connection to political outcomes. Yes. And parking the politics briefly, um, one area I think a lot of people in the audience as future business leaders um, are interested in is, yes, we all have a stake in this, but how can we practically go forward in our roles after business school to, to give life to, to changing? So um, you mentioned innovation as one mm -hmm. possible pathway, but perhaps some more um, thoughts as a, as a recruiter. Can you look at maybe... 
unconscious bias, removing biases against educational background, um, interested in your thoughts on, on, on what yeah. we can take forward. Yeah, so one of the things we see in the innovation data, which I didn't uh, quite cover, was that um, one of the key determinants of who becomes an inventor is what they're exposed to. So you see, for instance, that kids who grow up in areas that have a lot more inventors are more likely to go into innovation themselves. But what's more, that's very specific in terms of the type of innovation they do. So let me give you an example. Let's say you take two kids who currently live in Boston. Let's say they go to MIT. And one of them grew up in Silicon Valley, which obviously has a lot of computer innovation. And another, let's say, grew up in Minneapolis, which you might not know has a lot of medical device manufacturers. So it turns out if you look at these two kids in Boston, the, kids who, the kid who grew up in Minneapolis is much more likely to invent or start a business exactly in medical devices. And the kid who grew up in Silicon Valley is much more likely to patent in computer innovation. And that's true even within gender, actually, which is quite interesting. So if women grow up around more female inventors, they're more likely to go into innovation themselves. And conversely, for men, it's about exposure to male inventors. So there's a lot of specificity in these exposure patterns. Now, how does that relate to your question about what business can do? So my sense is you know, one of the things that directly suggests is providing exposure to these types of opportunities to kids from underrepresented backgrounds. So that could be from things as simple as internships or programs in the community that basically help kids see that there's a pathway that they could pursue in a, given, uh, in a given field could make a really big difference. But I think that has to start at quite a young age. It's not just about, you know, I think a lot of companies think about how do I recruit more diversely at the point where I'm getting applications for a job. If you show, think about the, the data that I've been showing you, it's all about a pipeline and if you, from childhood, and if you only try to address the problem when people are coming out of college, so too many of the disparities are already kind of set at that point. So I think figuring out how you reach back to your local communities and get middle schoolers and high schoolers to see that this is something I might want to pursue would have a big impact. And with that, we might uh, now uh, throw to the audience. Um, we'll repeat your question uh, just because it's been filmed, but if you could talk loudly um, and clearly. Thank you very much, Brad. I mean, it's an understatement to say that uh, the data work that you showed us is amazing, and uh, I wish I could work with uh, this type of data for <laughs> international macroeconomics, but <laughs> we don't have all. So, uh, because you have so much power in the data, so I was wondering, you showed us, you know, these five kind of possibilities that could be causal uh, or are causal uh, for the outcome that you described. We can also investigate uh, cause, causes which could be linked to uh, healthcare, so uh, access to healthcare, mm -hmm. and also characteristics of the local labor market in terms of type of employment and type of employment contracts, for example, yeah. which could be linked as underlying factors to your, you know, father at home or not father at home, etc. But, but also other. Yeah. Yeah. So, so the question relates to, in addition to the five factors you've identified in your research, uh, in particular healthcare and labour markets, could you talk a bit about some other factors? Yeah, so Alain, yeah, I mean, that's, I think, uh, you know, an interesting set of factors to consider. And so among the various correlates we looked at, we did include measures of healthcare, measures of uh, labour market conditions. And surprisingly, you don't find very strong associations. Um, just as an empirical fact, when you and so that's why they don't show up on the list of the top five strongest correlations that I was showing there. And so, you know, part of what's going on, I think, is if you take the labor market uh, indicators, for example, so the pattern you see is that it's really about the childhood environment that's driving these differences in outcomes across areas, right? And so I think it's like take, if you just look at the map, take a place like Iowa, for example, which you wouldn't think of as, you know, strong labor market, a lot of job opportunities there. But what ends up happening is kids who grow up in Iowa do really well and then move to Chicago or to New York where they get a really high paying job. So when I was referring to location throughout this talk, it's where you grow up, not where you live as an adult, which is actually quite important, especially in rural areas. And so it's kind of an interesting, I think, finding about the production process. Atlanta is another good example, like what I mentioned, excellent labor market, not very good in terms of upward mobility. So 
That doesn't end up being a strong predictor. Healthcare access, also not a strong predictor. I was especially surprised. Um, we have some other work, which I didn't talk about here, looking directly at health outcomes, so looking at life expectancy in particular. There are huge differences in life expectancy between the poor and rich in America, and those very sharply across places as well. And so a leading hypothesis for that is differences in access to healthcare. But in fact, you don't find that much of a correlation. It's much more correlated with health behaviors rather than access to healthcare, which is not to say that access to healthcare doesn't matter, obviously, but in practice, that doesn't seem to be the key driver of variation in these outcomes across areas. So the question is, how can governments and policymakers in emerging markets uh, help, help solve this problem, and specifically looking at countries like South Africa dealing with this at the moment? Yeah, so I mean, Elias might actually be better positioned to talk about Africa in particular. But uh, I, at a general level, how can governments tackle these problems? So I think about kind of a few different classes of solutions. And I, I don't think we have the answer by any means. But let me give you what I think we know so far. So certainly integration and, uh, you know, I think can have a big impact. So one of the things we're doing in the U.S. where we spend about $45 billion a year on various affordable housing policies is try to design those policies more effectively. So concretely, what I mean is uh, currently many families in the U.S., about 2.5 million families, receive housing vouchers from the government to rent apartments or houses uh, wherever they can find them. What you see in the data is that most people end up finding housing in relatively low opportunity areas. Just that's what turns out to be the case in practice. However, what we find is you can identify places within a city that we call opportunity bargains, places that have good outcomes for low income kids but would be affordable using housing vouchers. And so we're designing interventions to try to provide families information, to encourage landlords to rent their apartments to such families to basically help create more integration, help families access higher opportunity areas. Another way in which you might go about trying to create more integration is by changing zoning laws. So in the US, many cities, basically opportunity is being concentrated or constrained by basically preventing uh, dense building in certain places. And so by changing those kinds of regulations, you can potentially have a big impact. So there's one set of issues on residential structure. To pick another example, I talked a little bit about education. And the case of teachers, uh, I think thinking creatively about how you improve the quality of education, starting with teachers, but then other aspects of schools as well. In the US, there's a big movement towards charter schools that are a little bit more free of regulations. I think those kinds of things, other evidence shows, have quite positive impacts. So I think thinking about the education sector can be quite valuable. I'll give you a third example in that context. Access to higher education is another, I think, important issue. So what you see, especially at private colleges in the US, is that there's a tremendous concentration of high income people. So for instance, uh, at Stanford, something like 20% of kids, the students who, who attend Stanford, come from the top 1% of the income distribution. And your odds of being at Stanford are about 80 times higher if you happen to be born to parents in the top 1% instead of uh, being a student from an average uh, family. And so that, I mean, to the extent hopefully Stanford has some value added and is uh, helping people do better, that's amplifying uh, inequality and amplifying uh, differences in opportunity. So how do you create more equitable access to institutions of higher education? I think there are various things that can be done there. So my view is it's not about one policy. It's about a combination of different things. And I think a lot of that can be done at the local level, which is very important 
because it's complicated to do things at a national level, but if colleges and city governments can change things, I think you can make quite a bit of progress. I have two questions related to two of the main facts that you present that really are uh, fruitful food for me. Uh, the one that impressed me most is the fact that there seems to be a much higher, if I understand correctly, much higher social mobility among the black women than there is among the, 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 the black men. Mm -hmm. Do you have a sense why? And there is anything that we can learn from mixed race families. Mm -hmm. Is there a difference between whether the man or the mm -hmm. dad or mm -hmm. the black? The second question uh, is related to one of the last charts that you showed. Because the narrative that uh, I think most of us are keen to believe is the idea that uh, high income families provide kids with more opportunities by investing more in children, and therefore they are able to deliver more and to achieve higher income. Mm -hmm. However, there is a chart to show at the end that uh, I found a, a little bit disheartening, uh, perhaps it's me being a little bit cynical, in which you have shown that even among children which have delivered among the, the top uh, percentile mm -hmm. of, the, of the math mm -hmm. score, whether they come from a high income mm -hmm. family as opposed to a low income mm -hmm. family, give actually them much more chances of being able to develop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Would it not possibly imply that what is special about high income families is not the fact that they invest more and therefore they allow children to achieve a better outcome? Because those are both children mm -hmm. that have achieved higher outcome. Perhaps it's more to do about networking mm -hmm. and the ability. And, and mm -hmm. there is, I think, there is some evidence that you see mm -hmm. in the IFS in the UK mm -hmm. in which suggests that that's a Despite being exactly the same grade, mm -hmm. children in private school as opposed to state school, mm -hmm. actually there's still there is this higher income, and they suggest the state to, mm -hmm. to make work for them. Mm -hmm. so the first question. Uh, <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll start with the first one, which relates to uh, uh, the upward mobility uh, between racial and whether there's a worth considering the impact of a mixed race family and the second uh, if I can paraphrase crudely and wrongly uh, is uh, relating to the parents investment in their um, children and there's some conflicting assumptions that might challenge our traditional thinking um, if you can elaborate on on that question. Uh, thanks a lot those are both excellent points so let me take the race uh, issue first so we were honestly surprised that the gender disparities are that different you know you might have thought intuitively there'd be a little bit of that but it's super stark. Uh, and so I don't know exactly what the difference in drivers are, but let me throw out some plausible explanations, I think. So I, the reason I showed the incarceration patterns is because I think that's a big part of what's going on in the US, both directly, of course, mechanically, if you're incarcerating 21% of people on a given day, those people have zero income. They're in our data. That's, uh, that drives, you know, that's important. Uh, and then more generally, you know, I think mass incarceration and what that does to people's outlook on life, the investments they want to make, there are all kinds of secondary effects that I think could, that could also have. Second, there's, I think, good evidence from the psychology literature suggesting that racial biases play out differently by gender. So if you think about the stereotype threat, you know, the, the anxiety that people feel, it's different for black men versus black women, and that could be manifested in the way people are treated that then affects outcomes. And then a uh, third possibility relates to what I was saying about single parenthood. So the vast majority of black kids in the US are raised in single parent families. And there's good evidence that the lack of male role models is particularly uh, an issue for men rather than women. So when you're raised in a single parent family, typically it's mom who's raising you, not the dad, right? And so uh, you know, that might amplify the disparities between black men relative to, to black women because black women typically have a mom, they have a female role model in some sense. Black men are growing up in an environment without men 
uh, in the neighborhood. That does seem to be a quite strong predictor of what's going on. Um, and by the way, that, you know, those things are related, right? So if you have mass incarceration, you have fewer black men around, which then perpetuates in the next generation. So I think all of these things kind of, kind of form uh, a cycle. On the second point about patents, uh, so you're absolutely right that you see this difference, even conditional on having high test scores related to parent income. Now, very important was that I was showing you test scores in third grade there. Turns out, if you repeat this analysis looking at test scores in later grades, what you find is that the low-income kids are steadily falling behind the high-income kids, such that the portion of the gap explained by test scores, if you did your thought experiment using test scores at eighth grade or 12th grade, you would start to find less of it. And so I think it's very consistent with the idea that parents are investing differently in terms of resources, access to environment, things like that, and the low-income kids end up falling behind. That is not to say, though, that the networks and later connections also don't matter. I, st I think both things are, are at play. So cool. I was curious about these trends in general for immigrants, since presumably to be in the data set, your parents would have had to pay taxes in the United States within a given year. So is it sort of in general these hold for immigrants? And then also um, just thinking back to the introductory statistics um, across nations, do you have a sense of how that varies for immigrant mobility? Yeah, so maybe to uh, quickly repeat the question, um, Chris raised the issue that uh, some immigrant families might not be uh, in the available data because they uh, didn't pay taxes initially in the US. Um, so yeah, uh, and, and then maybe in, in general, um, you know, what is, what is the effect of social mobility on, on immigrant families? Yeah, so the, uh, you anticipated correctly what the data challenge is, right? So for first generation immigrants, it's hard to look at mobility because if you don't see the parents in the United States, you're not gonna have a record of the parents' income. What you can look at is second generation immigrants. So like myself, I was born in India, but raised in the United States. My parents are in the US, so you can look at uh, people like that. And what you find are uh, some patterns that are very similar, some patterns that are different. So let me give you an example. So one of the things you see, I showed you blacks versus whites. You can of course look at other groups like Hispanics and Asians. For Asians, you see a pattern which has been noticed with smaller data sets anecdotally in the past, where Asians have very high rates of upward mobility, particularly low-income Asians, you see extremely good outcomes. And that's led to a literature in sociology and other fields on Asians as a model minority. Now, what's interesting when you look at these data is if you drop the second-generation immigrants from the analysis and only look at kids of natives, you see that Asians look exactly like whites. So the Asian model minority thing is entirely an immigrant phenomenon. Uh, and so there are important cases like that where you see really different patterns for immigrants. We have not investigated in great detail the patterns of social mobility for immigrants more generally because of the data challenge, but that's something I think that would be extremely useful to understand, especially in uh, you know, the European context, in the context of things like refugees and so forth. I think with Scandinavian registry data, for example, you'd be able to look at that along the lines of what I've been doing here would be quite valuable. And so just a question on in terms of this fantastic data. How does this information, or have you taken any steps to get this information to the people in the lower income sets? So obviously you're advising governments and yeah. policy makers, and then they, then they, they transfer that through their speeches, through their policies, and, and so forth. But in terms yeah. of actually giving the people on the ground who are living through this, maybe yeah. the kids themselves, yeah. this information, what steps do you take to make sure that the wider public know about this? Sorry, I, I quickly repeat. So the question is, um, obviously you've uh, uh, communicated your findings to policymakers, but uh, have you taken specific uh, steps to also communicate the findings to um, the people on the ground that are actually affected by low social mobility? Yeah, that's just such an important question. I mean, it's a uh, it's a challenge I uh, think about all the time. I mean, I think we are, we try hard to disseminate uh, knowledge to the general public, but that ends up being through media outlets like the New York Times or Wall Street Journal, which obviously does not, you know, in our circles feels like people have heard about it, but is obviously not relevant more broadly. Uh, and so I think social media can be quite effective. So we're doing quite a bit of work now with Facebook uh, 
Uh, and I want to think about how we can use uh, tools like Facebook, for instance, for kids who are applying for college. Uh, think about spreading information more effectively through those channels. Uh, I, um, in the context of these interventions we're doing with housing authorities to help families access better areas, that is targeted at families receiving housing vouchers. So you're directly targeting that population. But you know, coming back to this theme of what can business do, I mean, I think finding ways to actually transmit high quality information. And I think this is gonna become even more relevant in the next phase of our work where we're going to this very granular level where you can see block by block what outcomes look like, where you can really try to understand how decisions you might make about your own children would be influenced by this type of information. Uh, figuring out how you get that in the hands of people in general would be extremely useful. So we've had some conversations, for example, with Zillow uh, and other companies in real estate about basically taking this data in and using it in their websites, which lots of people use. Um, but more generally, I think thinking hard about that would be incredibly valuable. Yeah, maybe uh, Yanis, yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Professor, to be here. It was it is a very privilege to have you uh, Since the question about roads in the policy makers was covered, I was wondering whether there is scope to expand your research into other European countries, maybe, uh, or uh, other markets like uh, Southeast Asia, yeah. uh, Perhaps. Because it would be very interesting to see whether uh, stats will compare to uh, whether there are any significant differences between uh, different countries. Yeah, so the question was if it is possible to extend the research, the data that we have on the US to, to other countries. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think one of the nice things about these methods is you can easily transport them to other places where you have analogous data and you will get different results, of course, because the sets of issues that arise here in the UK, the subpopulations and so forth are completely different from the United States. And so one of the things we're doing in our research team while we ourselves are focused on the United States, as we expand our team, we're eager to send people from our team to help support that type of work in other countries. And so we're talking with people in Sweden and Canada and Australia, basically about doing a mirror of all of the papers we've done in the US and then building on that in various directions. And we'd be eager actually to do that here in the UK, and in the UK you have data that would allow you to do analysis like this, but it's a matter of getting the right set of people together to authorize the use uh, of the data for, for this type of analysis. I think it would have incredibly high value if you can put that together. Uh, maybe one last uh, question, or we can take the two combined so that... <laughs> Let me be uh, brief, uh, thank you. I was just thinking about the policy implications, and you mentioned the uh, the example of the net present value of about a quarter of a million dollars of truncating the distribution according to the quality of teachers. But you didn't mention anything about the cost of doing that. So you need to fire some teachers, and then you need to hire, let's say, a median, let's say, a good median teacher, but you haven't with what you're offering so far. So have we thought about how much it would take? Maybe it cost 300000 uh, to do that. I don't know. I'm just... Uh, Asking just to put the bottom line here. This is either obvious or we're missing something. Um, in terms of trying to figure out the, how we can expand some of the uh, interesting results you've presented, I wanted to just cross check two things with respect to some of your uh, controls in your experiment. The first one is uh, in terms of the cross sectional data, what, have you looked at the drivers of downward mobility? Mm -hmm. Uh, so, uh, are we talking about clusters of no mobility, or are we talking about clusters of impoverished states? Mm -hmm. right? So that's one question. Mm -hmm. uh, the other question is, as we look historically at the at this chart, which is staggering, uh, there are some pretty um, US-specific items here, uh, like, for instance, obviously the 40s and the 50s being quite unique mm -hmm. decades, mm -hmm. but also, Something which is very important from a macro perspective, the decline in labor share of income, uh, mm -hmm. which is a, a trend that everyone's trying to put their heads around. Mm -hmm. Have you tried to think about cause and effect around, around, around those time series patterns? Yeah, so to quickly repeat, the first question was uh, specifically looking at the teacher example that you mentioned. 
and whether you've done you know a, a thorough cost benefit uh, analysis also taking in, into account costs of hiring new teachers and uh, the second question said actually two parts the first one was have you looked at um, specific characteristics of downward mobility? And uh, the second part was uh, on the declining share of, um, uh, of the labor income, basically, in society, and whether that could be a contributing uh, factor. Great, yeah, those are all uh, excellent questions. Let me start with the teachers one. So uh, yes, so you can think about what the costs would be. So to give you a rough benchmark first, Typical salaries for a teacher, $60,000, $70,000. Um, so now, what is the cost of actually changing the teacher? So we're not, in this thought experiment, asking you to hire an exceptional teacher. We're saying, draw another teacher of average quality from your own pool. Okay, so you have a set of teachers. Let's just take another random draw from that pool. On average, it's going to fall around the median, so we're not asking you to go beyond that. So that I think should be feasible, but I think you hit the nail on the head in terms of what is the actual cost of switching teachers. And so that's a major challenge at the moment. So this data uh, was the basis for a lawsuit in the US that was quite influential called Vergara versus California, uh, where the, the central issue was that the current litigation cost in dismissing a teacher can be in the hundreds of thousands of dollars for the LA school district. But my view is that is not you know, some resource constraint that that has to be the case. That is the current institutional process. And so if you had more flexibility in terms of hiring, uh, I think that you know, in the private sector, that's obviously done at much lower cost. And so I think the, the way I look at it is it's feasible to achieve much larger gains. But given the cost we currently impose, schools end up sticking with teachers who uh, don't have particularly positive impacts on kids. The other thing to note is it's not just about um, replacing teachers, it's also about who you hire to begin with and also about the training that you provide. People haven't yet found a training program that really raises teacher effectiveness substantially, but the bigger picture message that I take from this is figuring out how to recruit and more generally retain top teachers can be incredibly valuable. But Current institutional constraints make that quite expensive. Now, coming to the second uh, set of questions. So, first on downward mobility. So, the pattern you see, it's kind of interesting, is that downward mobility varies much less across areas than upward mobility does. And so, the reason for that is it still adds up because it's adding up at the national level. But at a local level, if you look at a place like Atlanta or you look at a place like San Francisco, Turns out, if you're rich, it doesn't matter a whole lot where you live. And that makes sense intuitively, because if you're rich, even if the local schools are not good, you can send your kid to a private school, or you can hire a tutor, or whatever. You can kind of uh, insulate yourself from local conditions in a way that lower income people might not be able to. And so it's not just about kind of a common factor that's moving down, uh, moving the, the low income and high income people in the same way. There's actually a genuinely different pattern in terms of uh, downward and upward mobility. Um, and then on, on the last point on the drivers of this chart and is it unique to the US and how does it relate to the labor share and so forth. So one thing that's interesting about this, um, let me answer that in two steps. So first, let's just focus on the US. Um, what is driving this chart? So you might think, you know, is this about just the reduction in growth rate? So macro people will know that after about the 1980s in the United States, we've had about 1% lower GDP growth than we did in previous decades. And so if you think about this absolute mobility measure that I'm ending with here, intuitively, if you have lower growth, you're gonna have, you might expect you have fewer kids earning less than their parents, right? So is that just all that's what's going on or is it something different? So what we do is the following exercise. So imagine you had the same growth rate as you did in the 1940s and 1950s but you split the pie in exactly the same way that it's being divided today. So imagine that counterfactual exercise. What you would end up seeing is that this decline would only be about one third smaller than it actually is. Two thirds of the decline is driven by the fact that income growth today is shared very differently than in the past. So in particular, median wages and people below the median have ex experienced essentially no growth in their incomes over the past 30 years or so in the United States. So this is not about 
uh, macro trend in terms of rates of growth. It's about the distribution of that growth, which relates, I think, to a lot of the factors that I'm talking about, you know, broadly about education and human capital acquisition, but of course also forces like trade and other things that people have thought about uh, in the literature. So that's an explanation for the US. Now, what does that look like in the UK or other countries? Is the pattern the same? I don't know. In fact, we have a set of students at the moment replicating this type of analysis, which is not, it's a very simple statistic. It's actually quite complicated to compute because you don't have the panel data where you can directly compare parents to kids. So you have to figure out how you do that with cross-sectional data sets, but we've developed a method of doing that. Uh, and they're applying that to many other countries. So I think in about six months or so, we'll have these series for a few countries and we'll be able to see what that looks like. Professor, we'll, we'll leave it there and pass back to our director of the Wheeler Institute. But uh, on behalf of the students, uh, we're very excited to have you here and, and, and very appreciative of you sharing your findings. But I'll pass over for the more formal vote of thanks. So I just wanted to thank Raj for taking the time and visiting us and giving such an inspiring talk. So thank you, Raj, very much. And, and let me just conclude. Uh, many of you asked, uh, what can we learn about inequality and mobility in other contents? So the Wheeler Institute for Business and Development will host an event on the 11th of July uh, with Darren Atsemoglu, professor of economics at MIT, who I guess many of you know from his uh, path-breaking research on institution and his international best-selling book, Why Nations Fail. But the focus of Darren's talk is going to be about the effect of automation and technological change on the labor markets in India and other emerging markets countries. So uh, you will receive emails, and we hope to see you also in July, uh, if you happen to be in London. So again, thank you, Rajat. Since Tony is here, let, let, we are all grateful again for your generosity. <laughs>